Good morning, church. So obviously we are a little light in number this morning. Um, holidays and sickness and different things, of course, but um, that doesn't mean that we can't all praise together. So let's stand and sing Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Bernie, and a warm welcome especially if it's the first time you've joined us here at New Life. We would love to invite you to join us in the hall for some light refreshments afterwards. And a note to everybody else, it's a bit cold and wet outside, so let's exit through the way we came in and go to the hall for our morning tea this morning. There's not going to be a kids talk in church today, so after this next song, the kids can go out into the hall for some activities for the school holidays. What a blessing it is to be able to gather around God's word together this morning. This week's collection is for The World Transform, which seeks to provide emergency and practical help to the poor people in our Asia-Pacific region. If you're visiting with us, please don't feel obliged to give. Uh, our church picnic is going to be held next Sunday at Andrew Campbell Reserve in Prospect at 1230 
uh, and it's BYO and everything. And let's pray for some good weather, <laughs> better than today. Uh, a few save the dates as well. The 30th of July is our congregational meeting, so save that evening. Uh, and August the 13th is Ladies' Day, and it's here at New Life. So ladies, pop that into your calendar and uh, be ready to come along and be encouraged and blessed. Today as we dive into God's word, Phil is going to be helping us explore Romans 12, 1 to 8, considering what it means to worship God. In John chapter 12, verse 25 to 26, Jesus says, Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. May the Lord help us today as we seek to serve him by following him. May he lead our hearts where he needs them to be and to shine light on what we need to change. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that we can gather to worship you this morning. Please help us to understand your words and to consider how they might impact our lives. Help us to serve each other well today and to honour and praise you as we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. So this next song talks about the family of God and so we are all God's family regardless of our age and of course we have family who aren't here today necessarily might be joining us online because they're sick or on holidays but if the kids, any kids want to come down here, my friend Phil is getting some instruments, you can come and play some instruments, you can come on the stage with us if you want to or you might want to be more back with your parents if that's a bit... Um, much so come down here if any kids want to grab an instrument because we're going to sing oh how good it is so if all the grown-ups want to stand up and everyone wants to stand up and if any kids want to come down they can Dwells in the presence of his being. 
guys. Everyone give them a clap because it takes a lot to get up here and there's only a few of them. So good job. Thank you for helping us with the battles. Everyone can take a seat. Thank you. Give the kiddos a chance to get out and then we're going to pray. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we pray to thank you that you are our Lord and Saviour, that you have given your life as a ransom so that we may be set free from the bonds of sin. We pray to thank you that where we deserve death and separation, we gain eternal life and a place in your family. Lord, please help us to serve you by sharing your word, not only through what we do, how we love others practically, but also give us the courage and the strength to be able to tell them, to confess with our mouths that you are our Lord and to tell others that we love because you love us. Lord, we pray that you will guide those involved in the World Transform Committee to distribute the funds where needed. And we pray today that you'll help us to give generously to that cause. Lord, help us to be generous to those closer to home as well. Help us to give of our time and resources and to make sure everyone has what they need and to do so in your name. Lord, we pray for those amongst us who are grieving. May you be with them and may you help us support them too. We pray for those who are lonely, for those who are single. May you help them to feel connected in your family. We pray for those who are suffering through the floods that we've had recently, whether here amongst us or others out. We pray that you will look after everybody's needs. Lord, we pray that you'll help each of us to look for you in everything that we need in every circumstance. May you help us to know that we are never alone that you are always here with us and that you love and care for us. Lord, we pray for our world which is groaning under the pain of sin with war, famine, floods and viruses and people who collectively don't follow you. Lord, we pray that you will help us to be a light for you in this dark world, that people may look in and see that in you we have assurance, love, commitment and rest for our souls. We pray that people looking in may want to know you too. And we pray for opportunity to tell them about you. Lord, as we open your word today, please help us to understand it with our heads and our hearts. Please challenge us from it and help us to be better worshippers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's Bible reading will be from Romans 12, verses 1 through to 8. And the section is entitled, A Living Sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, 
do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So far the reading. Can everyone hear me now? There we go. Thank you so much, Reuben. And again, thank you, Willem, uh, for reading that. Please keep your Bibles open as I will be jumping back into the Word. But I want to start by saying that up until today, I've been trying to not lose my voice. So if I make it all the way through this and you can still hear me clearly, it is by the grace of God. To those joining us for the first time or who have missed the last few weeks, My name is Phil and we are starting a new topical series uh, on having different aspects of the Christian life to be gospel-centred. This week I'll start off with gospel-centred worship. Jason will be next with gospel-centred serving, Angelo for gospel-centred mission, and Glenn to wrap up the series with gospel-centred church. Now aside from having four different preachers, each with a unique perspective, what makes it unique is that each topical sermon will have a different section of scripture to draw upon, rather than a series working through the same book by the same author. It also means that we might draw upon other areas of God's word to support each of these topics. Because as Timothy writes, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, before we do a deep dive into God's word, it might help to define the title of this sermon, Gospel-Centered Worship. Let's start with gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus, God's son, came in human form. He lived a perfect life that we could never live, He died in our place to take the punishment for turning our backs on God and was raised to life again by God three days later to prove that death does not win. Jesus always wins. See, the bad news is that we are broken and messy and so far from God, we cannot save ourselves. But the good news is that Jesus came to live the life that we could not. He restored this bridge between us and God. So then, what is worship, and how can it be centred on the gospel? Well, let me start by saying I did not pick this passage to preach on. It was picked by faithful brothers Glenn and Jason, and they thought it appropriate to get a music team leader to explain worship. Worship is not music. Music is a part of worship, but music is not everything. Worship is everything. Worship is all of life. As I said, I didn't pick this text, but I actually did pick it a month earlier at my Bible college class where we were told we'd be starting our own topical sermons. And the topic that I chose was about gifts. So where did I find a scripture about using gifts? Right here in Romans 12. But that's not the only time God used this passage. Just over a year ago, I was asked by our pastor Brian to write a flow chart or a document that explains the process of how someone should be introduced to music ministry. And of course, we had to ground it in prayer and God's word. Now, Sam Burnett, our music, sorry, our magnification leader, offered this passage from Romans 12. And the other passage I chose was inspired by Colin Buchanan, a Christian songwriter for kids' music. Now, his motto is Colossians 3.17. But verses 15 and 16 are vital to understand worship as a whole. This is what it says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, 
singing to God with the gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see what it says about members of one body? That means it includes all of us. See, God's message about his son Jesus is to be at the center and be amongst us, richly, deeply, like a tree that plants its roots deep into our hearts, into this community. Branches that then spread out to bear good fruit from using God's gifts. One body with one head. Jesus is the head, the head honcho, the head shepherd. One body, the bride of Christ, and Jesus, the groom. So if you love Jesus, you can't not love the bride, the church, the people. Because this extends to loving each part of the body, just as Christ has loved the church. And that is summed up in the greatest two commands that Jesus gave. Love God with everything you have, and love others like you love yourself. So where do we begin? Let's begin at the start. Worship begins in our relationship with God. Verse 1, giving God everything. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do you see how the subheading is called a living sacrifice? These titles weren't included in the original text but they were added later when the Bible was pieced together. But it sure does help us understand who is the living sacrifice. Well, it's calling us to put our whole selves on the line. Not just your body, but every part of it and what you do with it. Like a parent would do anything to stop their child getting in harm's way, putting themselves on the line. But as any follower of Jesus knows, or any follower who wants proof to trust who they are following, we don't go in blind faith. A follower wants to see their leader be willing to do exactly what they're asking of their followers. Jesus was the first and foremost living sacrifice. He is the most important sacrifice there ever has been and ever will be. And that's why the Bible says that his sacrifice is enough to cover all the animal sacrifices that God's people made before Jesus, and it's enough to cover that there's no other sacrifice that can be made by anyone after Jesus. And that is enough to call you saved. Jesus is all you need. Full stop. You cannot give more than God. But in response to his great love for you, we should offer what we do have, ourselves. That belongs to God. He gave us everything, so we give him everything. And Paul tells us why. He says it plainly in verse 1. In view of God's mercy. As in, the mercy God has shown to us by sparing us to sacrifice Jesus. See, our sacrifice is meant to be living and active. Just as we heard lately in our series through James. Faith without deeds is dead. So if our relationship with God is the most important thing, it will show. Now, those who live for Jesus and understand that God loved us first, he graciously gifted us a life free from sin. So a life with him and living to serve him and others out of love is a response to this gift. Giving God our minds, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know what else God inspired Paul to write about our minds? In fact, he has a lot to say. Along with Romans here, he says to the Philippians, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And Colossians 3, that other chapter I read before, that starts off, since then, you have been raised with Christ. So set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Clearly, Paul had a lot on his mind. But he makes it clear that God is the one who can change it. And he is the only one who should change it, not the world. 
Do not let the ways of the world corrupt your mind. Because God made your mind. Not only did he design it, he created it. And he understands it better than anyone else can. He even understands your mind better than you can. See, the brain is an amazing thing. The way it responds to trauma in ways that it tries to protect you. Even if you're not consciously using your mind. God knows what your mind has been through. And he wants to restore it. To reset it. To renew it. To make it the way that he first designed. See, Colin Buchanan wrote a song called Be Careful. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouths, what you say. And be careful, little feet, where you go. I firmly believe these words are not just for little people. Because at the end of every verse it says, There is a father up above and he's looking down in love. And that goes for all of us. See, at the start of this year for Jam, which is Jesus and Me, our Friday night group for primary kids, the first night we asked the kids to make new rules based on the fruit of the Spirit. And then the next time, our first lesson about following in Jesus' steps was a lesson called Garbage In, Garbage Out. What we put in our minds comes out in our words, in our actions, in our behaviour, in everything. So I filled up a clear plastic jug with clean water. Now, I had another cup. In it was, yes, some water, but there was also dirt and sticks and leaves. I asked if any of the kids wanted a drink from that. They weren't so keen anymore. So I dipped a sponge in the dirty cup, making sure that our minds, like a sponge, would soak it in. And then I squeezed it out into the jug of clean water. That jug represents what flows out from us. And just like the kids, I hope you get the picture. Which is why we need to not only give our minds to God, but we also need to be giving God our will. Verse 2 again. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. See, we need minds that are centered on Jesus to be able to understand and discern God's mission. That is what his will is to be on mission together. And because Jesus is now with God in heaven, it is the Spirit of God that has been given to those who believe. And that works in the hearts and minds to be able to understand God's word. But not only understand it, but also to apply it. As in, do it. Being on mission is a big part of God's will. So is magnification. Magnifying the glory of God for others to see helping believers and those who don't know Christ to see how great God is, how magnificent, how much he deserves our praise and worship, but more than just our songs, in all that we do for us to see just how big God is. And I think Colin Buchanan wrote a song about that too. Now notice how it's God's will, not our own. So we need to give up this idea that we're in control. Other parts of God's will includes maturity and membership. And I'll get to these later on. But firstly, worship involves our relationship with others. Verse three, check yourself first. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Again, subheadings really give us a gospel uppercut here. Humble service in the body of Christ. Do I need to explain that any further? Jesus is as humble as they come. But let's be real with ourselves for a second, or a minute, however long it takes. Where are you at? Are you proud? Are you humble? Are you serving? Do you give financially? Are you encouraging? Would other people say these things about you? What would you honestly say about yourself? Are you ready to do what? We heard it last week in Glenn's final sermon in James. I know I should do this, but I don't. Are you ready now to do what? Whatever it takes. 
Jesus isn't asking for everything all at once, and neither am I. But what is one thing that has changed or grown for you since last week? Or last month? Last year? Maybe has your prayer life changed for the better? What about your understanding of God's word? Have you been more loving to someone? More loving to many someones? See, worship calls us to faithfully cooperate. Verse 4, just as each of us have one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, each member belongs to all the others. See, here at New Life, our vision is to see a loving community growing followers of Christ. And the mission or goal is to see people want to be part of God's family. They are built up and equipped as God's people for works of service to one another in the world. And then we send them out to start the process all over again. Now, Paul is using that image of the body of Christ to be built up to reach unity in the faith. This idea of being built up through the work of God's people has two connotations. First, build up in number, as in new converts, new members. Evangelism, with a heart for mission, is the purpose of growing the church to see more people be unified into believing in Christ alone forsaking all other beliefs that we once had. That is why teaching and evangelism is so highly valued. And second, we encourage to build up in maturity. Whether it's through words, let it be God's word. If it's through acts of service, then do so with God's gifts in God's strength, not your own. So let's use our different gifts. Verse 6 We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If you have a gift, use it. It says do it diligently, which is to the best of your ability. And then it's to the best of God's ability. If you don't know what your gift is, ask God. Ask another believer. Someone who knows you to help you identify what it is. These gifts aren't rare or supernatural. Every believer has one or more. It's not a competition. If you worship God, gifts will naturally come into play. But let's start by simply being available. Be available for God. Be available for other people. How about we put it into the context of new life today? Working together, cooperation is a gift. Are you cooperating? We are better together. Look at how well our leaders are leading, from session to life group leaders, those who serve our kids together on Sunday as teachers and helpers, our Friday night programs like Jam and Youth, those who warmly greet you as we walk in or check your name off. So what gifts are these people using? Well, the fruit of the Spirit are not spiritual as in uncommon gifts, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But they are uncommon when we put ourselves first instead of putting Jesus at the center of our worship. Did you know what Paul says at the end of writing out all those fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5? Against such things there is no law. So Paul knows that God has given us the same grace And that grace is given in the same amount to each believer. It just expresses itself differently. Some are available, sorry, yes, some gifts are available for almost everyone. If you can pour a cup of tea or coffee, that's a gift. And don't take it for granted. Some people can't do that. Perhaps they're physically incapable or mentally unable to process doing that. So don't discount gifts just because it seems small to you. Peter writes in his first letter, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now, I can clearly remember a kid's talk that was given here about 15 years ago. 
So I was probably a little more than 10 years old. And whoever was presenting showed us a serrated kitchen knife. They asked us kids, what is this used for? Since it's small, can it be used instead of a scalpel, a doctor's knife, used to very carefully make a medical incision? Or because it has teeth, can it be used instead of a saw to cut wood? No. A serrated kitchen knife is for food, like tomato. And what we learned from the Bible that day is each has a gift. Each is different. So let's use our gifts properly. So as 10-year-old me, I retold this kid's talk in front of the entire church, painfully expressing what this meant for me and our church that was struggling to fight through tears all those years ago. Because so many were leaving church, having been hurt for all the wrong reasons, and because people weren't using their gifts. Some would sit on their hands, myself included at the time, and others were not able to properly use their gifts. It's sad to say, but it it happened across the board. Not just in one area of worship, but in many areas. And I'm not here to reflect on the pains of the past, but I'm here to point us forward with all hope to Jesus, the cornerstone and foundation, who slowly but surely rebuilt this church to be a family, person by person, to learn from the mistakes I've made along with others and to grow from them, to grow together and work on it together, knowing we all need more of Jesus. Now, whether you say amen or amen or amene or however you end your prayers, do you know what that means? It means a few things. It means true, very true. It means I agree. It means let it be so, as in, You just said this to our God in heaven, and he has definitely heard you. So if it's his will, then let it be so. So if you agree we all need more of Jesus, please join me right now and say, Amen. If you're struggling in your heart to agree that you need Jesus, let's talk about it. Come and talk to me or someone sitting around you that you know is saved or born again. Ask them. How did you become a Christian? Why did you do it? Some people have that light bulb moment, and for others, it's a gradual growth to understand it in your head and your heart. Either way, I can guarantee you their answer should still be it wasn't me. I didn't do it, God did. And that's what the difference between Christianity and any other world belief it's a relationship. Religion says, do it, and Jesus says, done it. And that's why we always have to lift our eyes to him. For years, we have been growing and working toward this gospel goal, and we re-look at our vision every two years to make sure that it's in check, to look at what's been, and to look at what's ahead. That's what our church will be doing again at the end of this month, to see the plan and then move forward. That's what Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, didn't he? Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you think that Paul literally meant he forgot all that had happened? Of course not. But his life before this, from being the worst of all sinners as he hunted Christians, and then even as a saved servant, of the king, all of that was no measure for what was to come. Did he forget the pains that he faced sharing the gospel to those who would throw him out of town or imprison him? Of course not, but it didn't stop him trying to get back up, to focus on what's ahead, each day closer to Jesus. What about the writer of Hebrews and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us? fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider him who endured such opposition from sinners like us, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. That person was telling us to look back to the cross, the center of our worship, the resurrection, 
and look ahead to the coming King Jesus. That is what these faithful Christians were fighting for. And this place, once called Blacktown Christian Reformed Church, changed a lot more than his name because many stayed here. Even more people joined the ranks and together they fought to make the gospel the center of our worship. Not putting us at the center, but putting Jesus where he belongs, front and center. When we put us at the center of anything, it's going to go pear-shaped or worse. I like pears. But making ourselves the center never ends well. It has a few names. It's called selfish. That's called consumerism. That's called pride. Putting God at the center always ends in good. It's for our own good. It's good for those around us, whether they are believers or lost in the world. Keep the most important thing, Jesus, as the most important thing. That's what Bernie Coleman, who was up here earlier, prays every time I hear her pray at our staff meetings or at script, scripture for school before we go and teach. Keep the most important thing the most important. What's most important to you? Is Jesus your everything? See, when we realize that Jesus has given us everything, then we make Jesus our everything. See, in response to God's great love for you, have you given your everything to him? Everything we have been given from God should be used to worship him. All that we have belongs to him, doesn't it? Our whole being belongs to him. Or maybe there are some parts we refrain from giving to him, things we hold back. But why should we? He literally put his life on the line for us to belong to him. So if one part of you belongs to him, then your whole being should belong to him. Giving over to God isn't to earn your place as his child. If the Holy Spirit already changed you from the inside out, then you were already his when he adopted you through the payment made by Jesus. Let me finish with verse 8. If your gift is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And that's what Jesus did. What is gospel-centered worship all about? Jesus. If we do that, the church will grow. The church is each individual and the collective unified body of Christ with all its members. Let's pray. God, we praise you and we thank you that you rightly challenge us to put you at the center, the center of our worship, the center of our plans and decisions, the center of your will, not our own, the center of our minds and hearts, how we should relate to you and relate to each other. We are so sorry for when we've taken anything that isn't Jesus and we've made that our foundation. When we idolize ourselves, our plans, our success, with no second thought to you or to others. See, your success is the saving work of the gospel is what should drive us, to love you and to love others. And we pray this in the only saving name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. This last song is for the cause of Christ. As Bill's just preached, it's all about Jesus, our worship. So let's stand together and sing for the cause of Christ.
in God's word today, wasn't there? Does Jesus have our minds, our will? Are we letting him lead? Have we checked ourselves? Are we saying yes to Jesus through our choices, both big and small, or are we saying no? How can we serve God and in doing so worship him? Let's together consider what we've learnt today, how God has challenged us and how he wants us to change to be better worshippers of him. We do hope that you'll join us for some refreshments and together we can continue to consider how we might spur one another on to keep worshipping God together. Uh, remember, we're going out those doors and if you're confused, the collection boxes are in the foyer now. We're going to finish with these words from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16, which says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 